care about automated damage uh, assessment. And there yeah. he is. Thank you. You are. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let me figure this out. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Hi. So um, I'm Wessel. I am a data analyst at uh, 510. And before I start talking about automated damage assessment, I do have to give a small shout out to my colleague, Jacopo. He was already mentioned. He was supposed to give this talk. And Ada is actually one of his brainchilds, I would say. Um, but he's in Ukraine now working with the uh, Ukraine Red Cross, so doing good work. Unfortunately, couldn't be here, but uh, I'm happily uh, jumping in. Um, so 510 is the data and digital team of the Netherlands Red Cross. And as a team, we strive to improve the speed, quality, and cost effectiveness of humanitarian action with data and digital. So we try to apply data products to make humanitarian action more effective. Um, 510 actually comes from the total million square kilometers of surface on the earth. So fun fact for you. Um, and we center our work uh, along these six main teams. So we do a lot of work on anticipatory action, which is all about being prepared for when a disaster hits. We do a lot of work on cash aid. That's all about distributing cash and vouchers to people affected by disaster or armed conflict, you name it. Um, there's a lot of projects on data, uh, digital transformation, where we work with other national societies within the Red Cross or Red Crescent movement to uh, yeah, help them in their digital transformation. Or we provide, for example, data literacy trainings as well. Um, there are a lot of products on emergency support, which I will be talking about today. We have some projects on water and landscape restoration. And finally, we also put a lot of emphasis on the way we actually work within all these projects or and within all these teams. Um, every team has multiple products or services. I'm not going into that because today I want to talk to you about emergency support and more specifically, automated damage assessment. So internally, we call this ADA. So I might use that term uh, multiple times in this presentation. Then you know I refer to automated damage assessment. OK, um, let's get into it. So imagine uh, a disaster hits, for example, a hurricane. Um, after the hurricane passes, the affected area often looks like this. So there's a lot of damage, widespread debris, and the affected area can actually be very big. For example, an entire island like we experienced before. And in these cases, it's not necessarily known to emergency responders uh, where the impact has been biggest and thus which areas need to be prioritized. Where do we need to get the fastest to uh, offer help? Um, so it's really important for emergency responders to immediately know, or at least as soon as possible know, where are the people that in, are in need and how bad is the situation there? So which areas have been impacted the most? And there are multiple ways they can do this. For example, they can go into the field and have a look for themselves. But as you can imagine, this might be quite hard because critical infrastructure can be damaged or even completely destroyed, as you can see on, a, on this image over here. Um, so that's really uh, time costly. It takes a lot of time. Another option would be to use satellite images to manually check, hey, where do we see the most impact from this disaster? Um, and that's actually commonly applied as well. But you can imagine if uh, the area, the affected area is really large, this might also take a long time. So we want to be faster. So um, that's actually where Ada jumped in because we wondered, OK, how can we speed up this damage assessment? And we did so by automating the whole process. So what Ada does, it's an automated way to uh, assess damage to buildings after a natural disaster strikes. And we do so by using high resolution satellite imagery, which often is uh, openly available after a major disaster strikes. And we have trained AI models to automatically detect the buildings on these images and then also assess the damage to these buildings. So in that way, we can quite fastly come up with an uh, 
accurate and uh, yeah, easily reproducible uh, assessment of the impact of a disaster. And of course, there is a uh, fundamental flaw to this that we can only assess damage that can be seen from the sky. I will come back to that point later. Um, that's the general idea of what, why we do ADA. So how do we do this? Uh, I want to give a quite detailed overview of the entire process. And it actually consists out of four steps. So first we have to get the satellite images. Um, then optionally, we would have to detect buildings on these images. Um, using the, buildage, the buildings, we can assess the damage done to them. And then finally, we deliver the assessment to emergency responders. Um, yeah, so let's look at, uh, have a look at all of these steps. The first one is to get the images. Um, so the main goal here is that after a nitro disaster strikes, we want to get uh, high resolution uh, satellite images from before and after the disaster as soon as possible. So we have been using multiple sources from, for this. We've been using Maxar, which has an open data program, which often uh, for major disasters quite quickly uh, makes satellite images from before and after disaster freely available. So that's quite nice. We've been using that a lot, but we've also been using sources like Airbus or Planet. And up to now, usually um, we are able to acquire images within one to 14 days. But again, the goal here is to get them as quickly as possible. Um, and here you see some, uh, some examples of these images. And I think there are pretty examples where you can clearly see uh, the difference. So that's step one, get images as soon as possible. Then the second step is to find the buildings on these images. And we don't necessarily have to do this ourselves because there are a lot of building data is actually freely accessible on the internet. So we use services like OSM, which is OpenStreetMap. For those who are not familiar, it's a big project that uh, uh, yeah, offers a lot of um, geographical data and it's freely accessible. And there's actually a lot of building data on OSM as well. And as 510, we also work together with missing, missing maps a lot, where we organize hack, uh, mapathons. We sit down with a team of volunteers and we start drawing in buildings on the world map based on satellite images. So these buildings uh, are, uh, uh, might be available for the affected area. Uh, if not, there is also AI generated buildings by uh, Google and Microsoft. So we first check these sources. Are there buildings available for the affected area? If not, we would have to detect them ourselves. And for this, we have trained a neural network. This is a unit like uh, encoder decoder model or network, and I won't really go into it, but I want to mention that um, all of our code is freely accessible as well. It's all open source. So if you would like to have a look, the link is here. I think the slides will be shared maybe afterwards. So you can always have a look afterwards if you want to uh, know more. Um, we trained this model on the XBD data set. That was a big data set of 850K buildings um, in multiple areas. And uh, we have managed to come up with a model that performs quite well, actually. And then the end product is something like this. So we have the image, and now we also know where the buildings, hit, buildings are. So we can go to the next step, which is the most important, I would say. And that is detecting or assessing the damage to these buildings. Um, so the goal here is to assign a damage level to every building and the damage levels go from zero to four, zero meaning this building is not damaged at all, four, the building is completely destroyed. And to do so, to assign these data, uh, these uh, damage levels, we have trained, again, a neural network. This is a pseudo CNMEs network. Again, I won't go into it too much, but the link is here. And so what this model does, it is, uh, yeah, the end product is something like this. So as you can see for every building, it says, for example, here, the green buildings, these are buildings with no damage at all. And the red buildings are completely destroyed buildings. Um, the goal is not to deliver a map to emergency responders that they can go visit this place and for every building they know, okay, this building is completely destroyed. We need to do 
this and this and this. We can leave because it's not destroyed. The general idea is more to give an accurate ID of general areas that have been impacted the most, such that they can take that into their decision, into their decision making. Um, yeah, so I think that's uh, something important. Um, so how does our model perform? Um, the key challenge here is generalization to disasters the model has not seen before. So how do we predict damage uh, for a disaster that the model has not seen before in an area where the infrastructure might be different, the buildings might be different, different shapes, um, the specific the, the damage by this disaster might be different. So that is uh, quite a challenge. And a former research student of ours, Tinka Valentine, actually conducted uh, an, uh, her research on this, so to check uh, the performance of her model on different disasters. And she actually showed that, um, yeah, it actually works quite well, and it is capable to uh, give us, well, on a good enough level of damage predictions for unseen disasters, but it really differs per disaster. And what we also see is that it really helps if the model is trained and tested on disasters that it has seen before. So we first give it some examples of the disaster we want to make predictions for, and then actually make the predictions. Um, yeah, overall, we expect an accuracy of approximately 80% for an unseen disaster. I've shown some results here, some, uh, some uh, performance scores, um, and I've highlighted the best score for within this research where we've trained our model on two tornadoes and hurricane wind disasters, tested it on, a, uh, on another disaster, and we, I'm here showing the macro F1 and the AUC score. What is interesting to note as well is the, the yellow marked uh, row. It's the beneath one where you see that performance is even better because in this case, we have trained and tested the model on the same disaster. Main message, we there is an expected accuracy of 80% on unseen disasters, which I think is quite nice and it's a good achievement. Um, so let's have a bit of a closer look at the entire pipeline to give a bit of a better understanding what we're doing uh, when we're assessing damage. So the whole pipeline starts with uh, the satellite image providers. So they provide us the images, we download them. It takes approximately 30 to 60 seconds per image. And then um, these images might have overlapping areas. So the first thing we do is we actually, out of multiple images, we create one coherent uh, overall image. Um, yeah, so that way we can significantly reduce the data that is passed to our model. Um, so th that's the first step. And then these coherent images, we pass them along to a filter step. And in this filter step, we filter out, for example, large uh, bodies of water where we cannot use those satellite images. Or we have, um, which is unfortunately not yet part of this pipeline yet, but we have also trained a model to detect clouds. So in this way, it could also find satellite images that have too much cloud coverage to be useful and we can filter them out and also reduce the data that we actually pass along. Okay. so. Then we uh, end up with a set of usable, usable satellite images and we divide them into a pre-disaster and post-disaster set. Pre-disaster images are used to detect buildings. So again, we do this ourselves or we get freely available buildings. And these buildings and the pre and post-disaster images are then fed into the damage assessment model where we assign the actual damage levels. And this all feeds into one end product which I will come back to later. Um, so that's one single instance. It's one walkthrough of the entire pipeline from the images to the actual damage levels. And the affected area can be quite big. So what we have done is that we can actually divide the entire area into multiple sub areas and run such an instance for each sub area at the same time. And that, that saves us a lot of time so we can quickly analyze a big affected area, which all feeds into one ultimate uh, damage assessment of the entire area. Um, all right. Now, how do we make sure that our model always uh, 
performs as we expect so that we always get this uh, 80 percent accuracy that we would expect and this is actually done by manual inspection inspection so there will always be some manual steps in this process um, not only at this point but also before we start the whole pipeline we always manually inspect the satellite images are they usable are they of a good enough quality um, yeah so that there's also always some uh, some manual steps here and the validation how do we do it so we take the post disaster satellite images we overlay it with the damage assessment done by the model and we just manually have a look to see if at least four or five of the predictions made by the model are accurate as we judge it so we've trained ourselves a bit on this and to be quickly such that we don't to lose too much time here um but i think it's a necessary step we we need to do because we always have this uncertainty for new disasters um yeah and if we're happy enough it's time to actually deliver the results <laughs> to emergency responders and in our case uh, most of the time are the end users are uh, red cross or red crescent society in the affected country um, and up to now we have always delivered our results as a static map so we either take some kind of map from openstreetmap for example or the satellite images we overlay it with the uh, uh, predictions from our model we create a map and we share the map with our partners um, but we're actually proud it's still a work in progress but we're transitioning to the ada portal and this um yeah this really sets this this whole process uh, as a um, flexible and more sustainable product uh, so i want to tell a little bit more about this um, the ada portal it's a web-based application and it can be reached by the emergency responders uh, at all times. So they can always consult the, uh, the assessments we have made. Um, it's co-designed with, uh, with our end users because um, we really wanted to make sure that it actually fits their needs and fits into, yeah, to use their experience of what is it actually that you need and how can this fit, uh, fit in effortlessly in your work. Um, so we have included them. Um, it's modeler, which means you can easily overlay the map and the assessments with uh, secondary geographical data. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, only damage is often not enough. So you can easily overlay these maps with yeah, some kind of demographic data, for example, that you need in your decision making. Um, yeah, so the last point, it fits a bit with the first point, but we've also tried to make this portal as compatible with uh, the current uh, emergency response protocols as possible. So we wanted to fit in as much as possible with the protocols as well to really make sure that uh, it's actionable and yeah, you can actually act upon these results. And finally, as I already mentioned, we try to make as much as possible for work open source. So if you're interested, you can have a look. The links are here. Um, yeah, really do so. Um, yeah, so that's actually the entire process of um, of assessing damage to buildings or of ADA. Let's look at some challenges we are still facing and we face and at some next steps, things we are working on. Um, a first challenge I already mandated, uh, mentioned is that, yeah, this process is fundamentally limited to damage visible from the sky. Um, for example, if you have a building where the roof still seems perfectly intact, but there's damage to the lower floors, yeah, it's hard to spot this actually. It's hard to see and you might miss it. Uh, a second big challenge is access to satellite images. And yeah, this is actually, uh, there are multiple challenges here. Um, for example, we have experienced in the past that different providers uh, um, make the images available to us in different formats. So for, for every provider, we would have to find a new way of processing these images. Um, there is also, to get the images, there's an API, but that's quite expensive. So, and you were talking about huge files often. So we have been emailing around links and then getting, downloading them. And while well, we've been trying 
to find efficient ways for this, but this was also a struggle in the beginning. Um, yeah, I don't want to be too negative about providers, but sometimes they do a poor job at organizing the images. So we get a huge chunk of satellite images and yeah, we have to find the structure in there and, and, and organize them ourselves, which can actually cost a lot of time. While our key point is to be as fast as possible. Um, so that has been a struggle. And um, for small scale disasters, they're all not always so available. Sometimes we have to buy them and sometimes you don't find available satellite images at all. Um, another challenge is around governance and this actually being unclear around damage assessment. So damage assessments are often uh, a government's responsibility, um, but they might be quite slow or biased so we can do it but uh, what we have experienced is when we try to deliver our results um, what might hold the process a bit that often there is a lot of discussion about is this data sensitive with whom can we share it um, can we openly share the satellite images and yeah these discussions might hold the process a bit and finally um, we still struggle with ensuring um, local uh, localization or, or adaptation of this project, which uh, means that, yeah, we would actually, we strive or we like uh, our partner national societies within the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement to really take ownership over this product themselves so that it really becomes a, a process they can apply themselves whenever they want, how they want. Um, I think it has to do with, in the end, we try to make ourselves obsolete as much as possible as well. Um, but as you maybe might have noticed, it's just a little bit too complicated right now for an untechnical person to really do this by yourself. But um, we're working towards this, so that brings us immediately to the next step. And the first one is that we're currently working on a strategy uh, uh, of ADA as a service. And in this strategy, we try to define um, how are we making sure a long-term maintenance of this process so that our models keep up to date, that, uh, that we always have uh, computational resources. And yeah, just make sure that the whole uh, process uh, stays maintained. Um, we are defining user support. So what kind of support can we deliver with this and how, how would that look like? And um, we're looking for ways to get cost recovery of uh, the, the cost that you make while you compute this uh, damage assessment. Um, another thing we're working on, which is quite interesting, um, is developing a separate web interface where emergency responders could themselves um, validate their assessment. So some kind of interface that enables them to easily validate the prediction our model makes um, because they're on the ground. So they are the best to know, I think. Um, and But even the more nice would be if we could include them and build an interface which would make it really easy for them to manually label some buildings which we could feed into the model again, make our model better for this specific disaster and we get into this loop of uh, yeah, making uh, improving our model. So this is something we're looking into. Uh, it's not there yet, but it would be very interesting. And finally, we're also exploring active learning where if there's an unseen disaster, we're looking for ways to uh, quite effective, effectively with a small amount of data, retrain our model to make sure it, uh, it is, uh, uh, its performance is better for this new unseen disaster. That's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, I wanted to put my email address here if you want to reach out to me, but uh, I think we can share it afterwards somehow. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, one question about the classification of the uh, damage. Are there like international guidelines or how did you make it data set for the training? No, that's actually, um, I think I forgot to mention that, but this scale is actually, uh, it's used a lot. It's called the joint damage scale. So it's not something we came up with ourselves. And 
So um, yeah, label data we also found using this skill. So it's not something we came up with. So yeah. that is something that was already there. And it actually, for every level, it gives a kind of detailed description of yeah what the damage would be. So um, yeah, it's something you could look up. Yeah. Yeah. Does this also consider the function of the building, like if a hospital? Is damage versus um, no, but we could do that. I think there are you in OpenStreetMaps. You also have these tags, and we already use that for filtering. So you could actually in, uh, and this would also be something I think you could easily overlay in this portal. Um, yeah, where you could also look at what kind of buildings are we talking about, which might be quite crucial as well, indeed, when you're talking about hospitals or that kind of stuff. Yeah, other question. Yeah. Uh, I've seen the tool in action. It's a great, great thing for same Thanks for sharing the, the the background. I was wondering the the GitHub repos. You, mm -hmm. you shared everything is open source. Are you mm -hmm. open to contributions to that as well? Um, yeah, I, I think yes. We uh, let's get in touch with Jacopo on this as well. Um, how we how we. Uh, but in general, we're really open to to collaborations on this. I mean, I have to say. Um, when we apply it for a disaster, there, there are the funds and the support to do it, but we have been struggling in the past to find funds to actually <laughs> develop this. And as you can imagine, there's, yeah, it really takes some time to develop this. So uh, it's been built up by a lot of research students, volunteers, us finding hours here and there. So uh, we're always, always open for collaboration on this and to improve our models. Uh, yeah, so definitely. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, so this is about damage for building. Do you think it's also possible uh, for damage to roads? Because that's very important for relief. Uh, yeah, workers, I yeah, think. yeah. Um, I'm not not familiar with any literature on this. I have not, but yeah, I, I mean, it all depends. Is there a label data set for this? Do we have yeah. the data for it? And I, I wouldn't see then why not. You, you could use, I think, a similar approach. But yeah, I'm not familiar with any work on this. Um, but it would be cer certainly interesting for us as well to eventually uh, yeah, make the scope a little bit bigger. Yeah. Indeed, because it's so crucial in these responses. Uh, what's the state of the infrastructure? Thanks. Uh, not easy to do, but uh, have you also thought about involving uh, the crowd? So the mobile phones that are uh, proliferated in all these, in all our countries, that people can also contribute on the ground and say, like, not necessarily rescue workers, but also. Yeah, I'm not sure if we also already done it with the crowd. Maybe, how do you know about it? I know we have. Done with uh, partners. Lebanon, uh, explosion, the yeah, exactly. But I think was this the crowd or was were this uh, partners there as well? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. What's the name of this app? There is this app. We actually. Mapillary. Yeah. So that indeed. was used, and it's, yeah. so normally it's a crowd adding photos to Mapillary, and that's the pho those photos were uh, analyzed. But then, in that instance, actually volunteers drove around with cars uh, taking pictures. So in, in this case, indeed, it would be volunteers. So they, it wouldn't really be the crowd. They would still be involved with us. And we would ask them, hey, get your uh, phone or your iPad, put it in your car, and drive around over here. And then that data would be inputted to us. And then we very quickly actually manually updated a lot of these images. And then we could use it to train our model as well. So. Yeah, this is so, something we've been really looking into, uh, but it's not, yeah, it's still volunteers or relief workers. Uh, yeah, still involved people with the Red Cross, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, it, it, um, it maps out where the destroyed buildings are. There's also pretty emergency response, uh, give some information about the type of emergency response that is needed. Um, no, so actually what we, we, we really, it stays with this, I'm sorry, um, with the damage. So we just say, hey, this is the damage. It's not like giving advice on that as well. Because I think as well, we yeah, we trust the local Red Cross. They, they need to make this decision. All we do is empower them in making these decisions. Uh, we do not give further advice on that, strategic advice. 
I'm, I'm seeing a lot of um, yeah pictures of the Turkey earthquake in the slides. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, was this a test case that you used this data in the hindsight, or did you use it during? No, the we actually applied it. This was one of the our bigger use cases. Um, yeah, so we uh, we run the entire pipeline multiple times, and um, these are actually maps indeed we used then and delivered. Unfortunately, we didn't have the ADA portal then. Um, and also thing, one thing we encountered there was that uh, we got a lot of available satellite imageries for the more urban areas. And then later on, um, we were actually asked for more rural areas as well. And it would be actually be harder to get satellite images for those as well, of good quality. And maybe Bauk, you can also say something about this because you were there, you were kind of the end user, uh, how it was used or how it was received. I think that might be interesting. Oh, yeah, you, you mentioned it very well. So one, one of the big issues was, so it was a huge scale, the whole earthquake in the whole area where uh, probably around the size of the Netherlands uh, that was affected. And uh, yeah, so there were not enough uh, satellite images to cover the whole area. And that was actually what we were interested in to see, okay, which are the, the big hotspots. Yeah. Um, uh, and and we, had, we had, so we had a couple of areas um, where we knew, so that so we were we knew a little bit okay so Antakya is hit very very hard Kili yeah, is, is is hit much less so it it was it was a bit useful but there there were still uh, some gaps that that uh, actually need, need to be filled yeah so this resonates with this challenge of accessibility of satellite imagery and, right uh, so also, I think so you you also talked about uh, the, the the type of disaster it, it's tested with. I think mm -hmm. it's mostly tested with uh, hurricanes. Exactly. Yeah, around. yeah, 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 yeah. So that was also interesting for this, uh, for this use case. It was a large scale earthquake. Um, yeah, so I think we learned a lot from it again and we were able to uh, deliver some useful maps, but there were also some challenges still, yeah. Interesting, thanks. Yeah. Two questions, but I think you were first, all the way in the back. I'm not saying you were. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I have one question. You addressed this uh, transfer learning that is difficult to predict or to do it for a different region that is not trained on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you're currently using only the image of the area or do you combine it with uh, more tabular data like the location of the image? Or no, right now it's purely the image indeed. But if you have ideas on this, find us because again... You combine this with, with uh, at least for instance location, so where is this picture taken? Maybe that's... Yeah, Structure yeah, 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 yeah. Connection back to some uh, photos that are taken before the disaster. Yeah. Kind of classify what is the kind of houses or buildings that are in yeah. this area. Yeah. And yeah. combine that in your learning network instead yeah. of just only the image itself. No, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, you are right, uh, Can you share maybe a little bit more about the actions that are uh, based upon these kind of maps? So is it indeed which houses to dig into or is it which teams to allocate to which kind of area? Or yeah. can you share a little bit more about that? Bauke, I don't really want to put you on the spot, but um, so I've mostly involved, been involved with running this and then delivering this. So I think you are best positioned to answer this question because you were in the operation in Turkey deployed there yeah. so yeah so the letter what you mentioned so it, it's it's indeed knowing okay which area is hit harder so where do we need to send the the, the first supplies that we that that are coming in uh, so we can actually save most lives uh, but also um, not getting a sense of so at some point we knew there were roughly two and a half to three million people displaced in Turkey here uh, but then you want to know, okay, for which areas is it actually impossible for them to go back to their home because it's destroyed? And for which areas they might be able to go home because uh, maybe there's some minor repairs or something like that. And then the intervention is quite different. So it's also knowing uh, what kind of interventions are needed in, in, which, in which areas. Yeah. Maybe if that was not clear enough, so Bauk was deployed from our team to the Turkish Red Crescent, right? Uh, during this operation. Yeah. Online? Okay. Have you uh, tried infrared imagery or other for disasters like hurricanes? I know there has been research conducted on, on 
different kinds of images. Actually, the first time we did this, we did it with drone images. It was at St. Martin and we made these images ourselves. Um, but I have to excuse you for the exact results from that, but we can share, and we can definitely share uh, the results from that research, yeah. But we have experimented with it, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. Fantastic. Thanks a lot.